Hi there. Good good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen now. I see I've just been given the power. I uh, hope you can see that. I will actually uh, switch off my video camera to save a bit of bandwidth because I'm actually uh, on holiday in France, but it's a great pleasure to, to join you uh, in, in London. So uh, I trust you can see that okay. So my name's Adrian Hopgood. I'm from the University of Portsmouth and I've entitled my talk an open source framework for multimodal AI. And so here's what I'm going to cover uh, today. I'm going to start with a broad overview of AI and then the main thrust of my uh, talk will be about um, five justifications for using multimodal AI techniques uh, and I'll finish up with some conclusions. The open source bit I should stress right now in case I forget to emphasize it as I go along is that I will be making quite a lot of reference to a software framework called DARBS and that is available as open source software. So let's start off with um, what is AI. So a uh, a standard definition is something like this, mimicking human mental faculties with a machine. Um, it's okay as a broad based uh, definition, but it raises as many uh, questions as it answers. Um, first of all, does the AI need to work like a human or are we just interested in some end results? Um, mimicking implies sort of matching, whereas uh, in fact, in many aspects of AI, we're already seeing AI that exceeds the human, certainly in terms of capacity and speed. Then there's the, uh, the thorny topic of uh, whether it can explain itself, and some forms of AI are better at that than others. Uh, is it just humans, or is animal intelligence relevant, or indeed all biologically inspired uh, computing may be relevant to AI? These are all questions, uh, not necessarily a right answer to any of these, because I think uh, AI me can mean different things to different people. And not only that, but what we understand by AI is uh, is changing. And here's a, a quote that from uh, Rodney Brooks that illustrates that very point. So Rodney Brooks is one of the uh, AI pioneers, been around for a while. And what he says is, every time we figure out a piece of it, that's to say a piece of AI, it stops being magical and we say, oh, that's just a computation. Uh, and I know that feeling well, because uh, I've worked in AI uh, for pretty much my whole career. So I've been uh, working in, in AI, I suppose, for um, about 37, 38 years. Um, so when I s started out, uh, chess was a, a major AI problem, which was effectively solved um, in 1996 when Deep Blue beat uh, Grandmaster for the first time. Likewise, I did quite a lot of work in character recognition and speech recognition, which, although not exactly perfect, uh, pretty much solved um, by, by AI these days. So, uh, and so we're constantly thinking about the next big thing of, of AI. We're constantly looking at it as a sort of future looking thing, which I think is what's reflected in that quote. Uh, and I would draw two broad families of AI, um, knowledge-based and computational intelligence. So on the knowledge-based side, this is what I think of as the sort of traditional end of AI that's um, really had its heyday in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, the, those who were around at that time may remember a great deal of excitement around so-called expert systems. Uh, so the gist of knowledge-based uh, intelligence is that it endeavors to capture human expertise, uh, human knowledge, human understanding within a, a computer system. And techniques for doing that uh, classically include rules, but also case-based reasoning, model-based reasoning, etc. Um, and I will argue that um, those techniques have not gone away. And in fact, there's quite a lot of people still working in the, those aspects of AI. But the headlines recently have all been grabbed on the, uh, the, other, the other side of the uh, Venn diagram in the computational intelligence area, which includes things like neural networks and deep learning, which is generally speaking, uh, just very large neural networks um, for spotting patterns in data, essentially. Um, but I've also put in there other 
data-driven techniques uh, like operational research, which is quite a tr traditional method of analyzing data, uh, genetic algorithms for finding optima in data. But the key point about the computational intelligence uh, circle in the Venn diagram, it's all data-driven. It's based on finding information from data, whereas the red circle is about uh, extracting information from humans. And then you've got some things in the middle, things like fuzzy logic and Bayesian updating, which are partially uh, data-driven, but equally uh, do uh, capture human expertise too. So why the hype around AI at the moment? Um, I think there are five reasons that I could think of. Um, a lot of the ideas that um, people have been working on, well, you could say since 1950, when, uh, sort of, uh, when Turing first proposed machines that can think, but maybe... Um, as I say, there was a great deal of excitement around this, the 80s, 90s, that sort of period. So a lot of those ideas from that period have now matured, um, much more sophisticated. Um, secondly, we've got loads of data uh, and people want to make use of it. Uh, there have been some real significant developments in the deep learning algorithms over the last decade or so. Uh, we've got internet resources, so any AI system has uh, a lot of information uh, available to it through the internet, variable quality, of course, but a lot of information. But I think most importantly, we've now got faster computers. So some of the things that uh, my academic friends and I were talking about 20 or, or 30 years ago um, are now practical on uh, everyday uh, com computers. Excuse that phone in the background, I'm trying to switch it off. So if I move on to my next slide, I'm going to discuss today why uh, complementary or, mul <coughs> uh, or multimodal AI. So I'm going to uh, propose five uh, key reasons, uh, and I'll go through them uh, one by one, but the first one up is multifaceted problems. So multifaceted problems, I think, is a way of recognizing that any real-world problem has many uh, subtasks associated with it. And I will be arguing in this talk that each subtask is best, best tackled by uh, a specialist agent, a specialist um, piece of software designed for that task. So when you build multi-agent systems, what you're effectively doing is modeling a team rather than an individual. I'm going to propose to you one specific architecture for building these model teams, these multi-agent structures, and that's the blackboard architecture. And I'm going to run through uh, uh, three examples. In fact, there will be a fourth which comes under my, uh, my other uh, justification for uh, multimodal uh, AI. So let's just briefly explain what the, the Blackboard model is. Uh, it's meant to be um, based around the idea of a group of experts gathered around a, a Blackboard, we might say a whiteboard, each with their marker pen and their eraser. And they work together um, on solving a problem by adding information to the Blackboard, contributing as, as, they, as the uh, problem evolves towards the solution. So they communicate via the blackboard. They don't communicate directly with each other. And this is a useful model for multi-agent collaboration. So colleagues and I, over many years, have built uh, a multi-agent framework, which we've called DARBS, which stands for Distributed Algorithmic and Rule-Based Blackboard System. Uh, the link to open source comes in because it has, for uh, quite some time now, been available as a freely available open source software. And the idea is that the, uh, well, it's based on that model of the, uh, of the experts gathered around a blackboard. Uh, so the experts here are based, uh, are replaced by specialist agents, uh, which might encapsulate some form of knowledge-based AI with those rule-based agents that I put there. It might be a standalone conventional uh, computational module, which I've labeled as procedural agents or it might be a genetic algorithm, or it might be a neural network carrying out some, uh, uh, some, some deep learning. 
Each of these agents um, communicates via an area of shared memory called the blackboard. And I'm going to talk you through some examples to give, make this a bit more tangible. So the first up, I'm going to talk about a specialized manufacturing process called plasma deposition. Uh, and we built a controller for this process using this approach of uh, multi-agent AI built around DARBs. So uh, plasma deposition, you don't really need to know the details, except that it's a, a complex manufacturing process, very difficult to control. The plasma in this context is a low pressure ionized gas. If you get the conditions right, uh, atoms, uh, well, ions from the plasma will deposit as neutral atoms on the surface of a component here, which I'm indicating with my cursor. <clears throat> but it's, uh, it's really hard to control. There are various things that I've highlighted in blue that you can measure. There are also things I've highlighted in red that you can control, uh, but the two are not mean. So you often have to infer a control action from the things you can measure. Now, this is what the kit looks like in a laboratory setting. And if you look through the glass window, this is what you'll see when the plasma is fired up. And I have a short video clip to, to, to show you. Um, I'm not sure whether you'll be here, able to hear the sound or not. It doesn't really matter too much. It's just the sound of some machinery. I'll just set it going now. You might be able to hear some whirring in the background, especially if I raise the volume, um, which is the sound of some uh, pumps pumping down the, uh, the vacuum equipment. And on the screen here, you will see the specialist agent whose job is to control the pumps using rule-based AI. And you may have heard some pumps clicking in there. Some noises now the plasma is fired up, uh, and that is controlled the electrical parameters controlled with a fuzzy logic module, which I'll tell you about uh, shortly. And now, finally, there is a screen uh, which has a, another specialized task, which I'm going to highlight now. So the last screen you saw uh, was a module, a software module, an agent whose sole task was to tune a device called the Langmuir probe. Uh, which measures the electron energy in the plasma. And that has uh, 14 variables, seven amplitudes and uh, seven, here we go, seven amplitudes and seven phases to be adjusted to find the, uh, the optimal uh, combination. So we used a genetic algorithm for that task. So a genetic algorithm doing that tuning. We had, uh, as I mentioned during the video, we had a uh, rule-based knowledge-based agents controlling the pumps. Um, go to my next slide. We had a fuzzy logic agent maintaining the uh, electrical parameters. And just to enlarge upon that a little bit, what was happening was if you look at the bottom screen here, there's a DC bias is what's being controlled as a set point of minus 400 volts. And every time you see a vertical line on these graphs, what we've done is we've gone in twiddled the knobs and knocked it off its equilibrium. And every time the fuzzy logic controller smoothly brings it back to its set point. So if you see there, every time there's a vertical line knocking it off, it smoothly comes back to its set point. And it does that by adjusting the pressure and the RF power. Sorry, the RF power. There's no, there's no knob you can control directly for the DC bias. Equally, there are other agents doing things like interpreting the optical emission spectra. So all these specialized agents working together because it's a multifaceted complex task. So this is one, this is my prime justification uh, for use for advocating multimodal AI. We used up DARBs in another application working with uh, BT. This is a few years ago now, so this is a little bit old, but we were using uh, a multi-agent approach to manage their telecommunications network. So we want a simulation of the network and the, the goal was to maintain quality of service. And what you see in this rather cluttered uh, screenshot here is uh, various pop-up windows, which are agents carrying out specific actions on the network to improve the quality. So top left here on a particular local link around Manchester, <clears throat> we've got, uh, some restrictions called call gapping uh, to limit traffic there. Uh, likewise, down at the 
at the bottom right side, we've got a, a similar mechanism called the trunk reservation factor for <clears throat> limiting uh, traffic on, uh, on longer distance routes. And the most complex action of all was the so-called uh, rerouting of secondary traffic. So finding alternative connection points, con connection routes uh, on the network to alleviate uh, points of congestion and to maximize quality of service. Uh, and this was quite successful as a prototype, built around DARBS again, I should have said that, this is another DARBS project. And what BT did actually at the time was they commissioned a few of these kind of uh, prototypes and took the, the best ideas uh, and built those into their, uh, their working systems that they're using at the moment. Um, a third example of uh, multi-faceted uh, problems is a recent PhD project uh, student just completed last year um, to do with that automated umpiring and we were looking specifically at table tennis uh, but this isn't like um, you know the elite game where you've got your your VAR or your um, Hawkeye the idea here is this would be a low-cost system to help with refereeing in uh, in the in the amateur game in a, in a local uh, village or town hall based on four video cameras low-cost video cameras easy to set up Probably the biggest task of all it was to uh, interpret the, what's going on in the game and specifically following the ball, especially as it's quite a fast uh, moving sport. Uh, and this uh, again used a multi-agent approach. We had ball detection agents, we had a, 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 a managing agent for the multiple views, we had a trajectory construction agent to, to, uh, um, to plot the route of the ball, we had feature detection agents, uh, and a state detection agent to determine the, uh, the state of the game at any one time. And then overlaid on top of all of that uh, was the, uh, the rules of the game, uh, sort of a rule-based agent, which actually explained the rules of the game. So again, and yet another uh, example of a multi-agent approach. So that was all based on multifaceted problems where you can break the problem down. I'm gonna give you a, some more justifications for a multimodal approach, starting with the verification. And first up, um, got the idea of uh, uh, ultrasonic imaging. Now this is quite early work. This was the actually the very first application of uh, DARBS. It wasn't even called that at the time, but a very first incarnation of DARBS. And this was to do with interpreting ultrasonic images uh, in an industrial context. Specifically, we were looking at a uh, steel slab with a weld down the middle. And uh, in, images in steel are rather different from medical ones. The way you form your image is by emitting an ultrasound pulse and listening for reflections. And the delay in receiving that reflection gives you uh, an indication of how deep into the specimen the feature was that reflected it. You have 10 different transducers pointing in different angles, uh, each of them doing that thing of emitting a pulse and listening for the echo. And this is the sort of image you get as a result. So basically a pattern of dot, dots, which requires a certain amount of uh, interpretation. So we built a multi-agent system to do just that. So I'll just look at some of the agents that, uh, that would typically fire in a case like this. So first of all, we had agents that uh, spotted lines of, uh, of these dots using a Huff transform. Then we had a, a rule-based agent to pick out sort of key features like the probe reverberation, this horizontal line near the top, and the back wall echo towards the back, some filtering agents. And then it gets most interesting when we start to look at the areas of intersection of those uh, those lines, so this area here and here. So neural network agents were fired up then to classify those. And in, uh, you may not be able to read this, the print, but what it's saying is that the network classification in each case is that each of those blocks is associated with a smooth crack. In other words, the neural network reckons those are two crack tips and that there is a crack running between them. But how can you trust that? You need, how can you be sure that that's uh, an accurate uh, uh, diagnosis or interpretation? So what we did was we used knowledge-based agents 
to, uh, to validate and verify that finding. Uh, and in this particular case, the final line shows that the defects were confirmed, and that's because the validating evidence was found. The sort of validating evidence that was looked for was by going back to the original image, or at least this semi-processed image, where you've got a back wall echo here. If there is a defect, a crack up here, you would expect a shadow in the back wall. In other words, a, a drop in its intensity of the, uh, the, the crack. And that is indeed, that was indeed found. Equally, we now have uh, an explanation for these features in the image over here, these um, diagonal lines, uh, which are actually artifacts consistent with ultrasound bouncing between the crack tips therefore having a longer uh, time of flight and creating the illusion of features deeper into the specimen. These are actually artifacts. That no, there's nothing actually here at all. It's just a, a result of the uh, ultrasound taking a longer path by bouncing between the two. We now have supporting evidence for that diagnosis, so this was confirmed. I'm going to take you to, um, and that was all built around DARPs again. I'm going to take you to some current work now. Um, where we're using uh, um, multimodal AI to look at the quality of health data. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> so data about uh, medical records and so forth. There's a lot of interest in uh, using machine learning to spot patterns in health records. So uh, health records are not the only source of uh, medical data. You've got clinical trials, wearable devices, genomics, health surveys, disease registries as well. But we're focused in on electronic health records. In principle, they're a fantastic resource for machine learning. In, a, in the UK alone, we've got more than 60 million uh, health records. If they were all uh, accurate records, that would be like a fantastic laboratory. You wouldn't actually have to carry out clinical trials. Uh, you, could, you could just look at patterns of uh, illness, treatment, symptoms, outcomes, and learn an enormous amount. Unfortunately, uh, electronic health records are not uh, flawless. In fact, there are an awful lot of errors in them, not just in the UK, it's a worldwide problem. And indeed, it is a problem that has been made it into the press. Um, so risking patients' safety through unreliable data. And this top right headline is quite eye-catching. The third leading cause of death most uh, in the US that most doctors don't want you to know about. Well, that is medical uh, error. So uh, according to this analysis from the John Hopkins University reported in the, in the Washington Post, medical error is the third most common cause of death. That's a particular perspective, of course, you won't often see it reported that way, but this shows the importance of having accurate medical information. So we are looking to see if uh, AI can actually help solve the problem. So we, we want to use machine learning to look at the medical data. Maybe AI can help us improve the medical data. So we've drawn up this taxonomy of error types from incomplete, incorrect, and inconsistent data. Sometimes uh, information in medical records is logically impossible. Other times it's unlikely or implausible. And we're looking at both the whole spectrum of types of errors using, again, a hybrid approach. So we, uh, the first two blocks in this block diagram are about uh, knowledge-based intelligence, so domain users building their own data quality assessment rules or deriving them from clinical reference standards. And we've built a, a system, well, I say we, my PhD student has built a system for uh, deriving those rules automatically from reference standards. Equally though, we're looking at data and finding patterns, spotting outliers um, and finding things that are implausible and using those to identify errors in medical records. And this is a sort of indication of some of the types of results we're getting, different class of classifications of error types from different invalid 
<coughs> formats, values, etc., uh, under under different um, in, in under different data items on medical records. So this is where we're going. This work is ongoing. Uh, we're hoping to uh, complete within the next twelve months. My third category for uh, justifying hybrids is uh, what I've called capability enhancement. Using one technique to enhance the capabilities of another. And I'm going to give you an example to do with oral cancer detection. Oral cancer is a nasty cancer. Uh, survival rates are not good, uh, partly because it's diagnosed rather late in general. So uh, prognosis is good if uh, diagnosed early. Uh, but as you can see in this uh, table, drops below the drops below 40% if, uh, if, it, if it hasn't spread. So our idea was that uh, wouldn't it be great if a dentist could routinely point a camera at an ulcer and just get a, a, a pre-screening of whether it was likely to need further investigation. The top two images in this uh, montage uh, are both benign ordinary ulcers that we all get from time to time called recurrent aptus stomatitis. Uh, bottom left, we've got rectilinear lichen planus, which is uh, mostly harmless, but worth keeping an eye on. And then at the bottom right, we've got the cancerous ulcer. So we built a, a neural network approach to this. It was a little while ago, and I'd really like to revisit this with some uh, uh, better technology and more data. But what we did at the time was pre-process the images to extract them into a form that could be used using the rather traditional, you might say old-fashioned uh, conventional neural network classifiers. The multi-layered perceptron will establish classifier for supervised learning and the self, the Cajon and self-organizing map, a technique for uh, unsupervised learning. And we got good clustering of the cancerous group with the uh, Cajon and map, but we actually found that to get the full classification of the different ulcer types, we actually needed a combination of different uh, networks uh, working together in this hierarchical fashion. So, this is, so I'm looking at this as using one technique, multi-layered perceptron, to enhance another the Cajonian network. So that's my third category uh, of multimodal AI. My fourth is parameter setting, using one technique to set the parameters of another. And this is relatively recent work. Um, it was published uh, just a year or so ago, uh, where we built a fuzzy logic controller for a genetic algorithm in the rail freight planning domain. So rail freight planning. This We're working with a company. This is one of their logos. What they do is they work on a, a one-week planning horizon, taking orders from clients, assembling virtual trains, assigning the fleet, then the big bottleneck in terms of the uh, the planning is the crew scheduling before they roster to individual drivers. So let me just briefly run through why crew scheduling is, uh, is challenging and important and how we solved it. So first of all, uh, there's the issue of contract utilization. So a rail freight company like this uh, issues contracts to its drivers for a certain number of hours per year. So if a driver drives fewer hours than contracted during the year, you still got to pay them for the contracted hours. So that's a waste of money, totaling nearly three million pounds per annum for this particular company. Equally, if you need a driver for more than their contracted hours, you've got to pay them overtime, which is another inefficiency, costing about another half million pounds per year. So in total, through inefficient use of the contracts, uh, this particular company is losing about a million pounds per annum. Let's look at why it's complicated. Here's a, a map showing four train journeys to be driven by a driver uh, on, a, on, on one shift on one day. Each driver will have a home depot. In this example, the home depot is in Oxford, the driver's first um, train to drive is in Bristol. So first of all, the driver's got to get there, for which they will typically catch a passenger train to get them to Bristol. They've then got three 
freight trains so that they can drive. They all connect nicely, leaving them in Cambridge. From Cambridge, their next job is actually in Milton Keynes. Uh, to get there on a passenger train, you would have to go through London. Uh, if they did that, they would uh, miss their appointment on the freight train. So what would actually happen under these circumstances is they'd catch a taxi across to Milton Keynes, drive that train, gets them to Coventry, 10.30 in the evening, too late to get a passenger train back to Oxford. So they would typically take another taxi. So this is the uh, so-called diagram, the, sched the schedule for that driver's shift. <clears throat> you can see that um, in particular, if you look at the bottom, the actual proportion of that shift that's spent driving a train is less than half, 46%. You will also see that, um, uh, that there are some additional costs, 70 pounds of uh, taxi fares. So this is, you can see that there's uh, some inefficiencies in a schedule. So what we're trying to do is try and optimize these schedules to get the, the trains, uh, the freight trains driven in the optimum way. There are other constraints too, in terms of health and safety, maximum, um, time behind the wheel without a break and that sort of thing. Um, there are these preferences in terms of maximizing throttle time. That's the amount of the proportion of the shift that's actually spent driving the train. You want to minimize the taxi and train trips. You want to minimize unproductive time, etc. The reality is it's a complex network with 550 freight trains per day, 3,000 trip legs uh, making on that making up those uh, journeys in the day. So we try to tackle this with the genetic algorithm. Just briefly, in case you're not familiar with genetic algorithms, they mimic Darwinian evolution. You start with a population of candidate solutions, pick the best ones and reproduce from them through a process of cross crossover, also introducing diversity with mutation, and you get a new population. And you repeat many times. And because you're reproducing from the fittest uh, candidates, the uh, population should evolve towards a uh, better solution. One of the difficulties with genetic algorithms is that there are loads of different parameters that you can adjust. So it becomes a little bit of a black art. But we built a a uh, fuzzy logic module to uh, adjust the parameters automatically. Inspired by the work of Herrera and Lozano, we built this uh, fuzzy logic uh, controller. Uh, and the, here's some sample rules of what it's doing is it's monitoring how well the genetic algorithm is performing through these things called convergence measure, cycle sense improvement, and the fitness variance, and adjusting parameters specifically the mutation probability and the crossover probability. And the result is quite impressive. If you look at the blue line, first of all, you'll see the performance of the standard genetic algorithm. As you would expect, you start with a pretty poor quality of schedule. And as the algorithm progresses, you evolve towards lower cost schedules. That's the blue line. But if you look at the red line, that's our fuzzy logic controlled genetic algorithm, you'll see that we get to a lower cost schedule more rapidly. This is what our system look like. You can optimize various things, but we would generally optimize on the overall cost, which is this uh, white uh, graph, uh, second graph down. And these are the results. Um, the manual process isn't bad, actually, because uh, the Royal Company does have people who who are good at the, the task. Nevertheless, our system uh, has improved upon it. We called our system sexy. Of course, you have got to have a good name. So ours is system uh, of evolutionary crew scheduling with intelligence. Uh, and you can see there the sorts of improvements we're making of um, some 5,000 uh, pounds daily. And that's just on the scheduling of the operations. That doesn't take into account the fact that we saved a lot of time uh, of actually manually uh, coming up with these schedules in the office. My final example of why I advocate uh, 
multimodal AI I've called divide and conquer. And specifically, we're looking at image registration here. I mentioned earlier multi-agents where each agent is tackling a specific task. If those tasks themselves are complex, you can envisage each agent being itself a blackboard system, if you like, a multi-agent system uh, with agent with uh, these nested agents carrying out the subtasks of the overall task of the overall problem. And here's one of the domains we're working in, which is image registration for medical purposes. If you look at the top two images to start off with, uh, top left, you've got a, uh, a visual image of a uh, patient with a, uh, some sort of uh, injury uh, on their torso here. Uh, you, top right, you've got a thermal image. And what physicians would often like to do is to um, superimpose those images and get a rich uh, presentation uh, of, of, this, of, of, of the evidence. But if you simply superimpose two images from different sources, you will always come across the registration problem, which is what you've got at the bottom right. The two images do not register. You need to distort one relative to the other in order to make them match. And the approach we adopted was to break this image down into, uh, into components cells, which is what this grid at the bottom uh, left represents. And each cell in that grid was allocated to a specific agent. And then another agent brought the whole thing together. So this is the result. We've now, by using that approach, dividing the image down into these components, we've got a nicely registered image. We've taken exactly the same approach in an industrial context where a company that manufactures uh, packaging materials wanted to maintain high quality screen printing. Specifically, they wanted to avoid defects like this one shown in the bottom right, where there's a bit missing from this, uh, from this uh, logo. Their original concept was that if you just have a camera pointing at these things coming off the production line and subtract the live image from a uh, perfect image, uh, a perfect template, then you would detect uh, any, any difference would be an error, would be a, a printing error. Uh, but that, of course, ignores the problem of image registration. They will never just match just like that. You have to distort one image relative to the other. So we did exactly that, use the same techniques as in the medical domain. We're able to <clears throat> uh, compare the images, remove these edge effects and isolate the defect labeled G in this image. So I've run through five justifications for complementary AI techniques, multimodal AI. First and foremost, and overwhelmingly most important, I think is multifastulums. That is to say that um, most real world problems have many subtasks and that each subtask is best handled by its own specialist agent that's best for the job. I then went on to verification where I argued that you can improve the quality of your systems by using one technique to validate or verify another. Then looked at capability enhancement using one technique to enhance another, parameter setting, and then finally divide and conquer with image registration. Looking ahead and where we're going, um, I, would, I have drawn this spectrum of intelligence. And looking at how AI has evolved, we, we've, from the very early days, have had a great deal of success at the bottom end of this spectrum with uh, low level coordination, regulation, reaction, things like automated uh, manufacturing plants have been around since the 1970s and 80s. Likewise, the early successes of AI were at the top end of the spectrum around expertise and planning. So capturing specialist expertise in areas such as law, medicine, scientific instrumentation. What may not have been foreseen at that time was that the most challenging areas of uh, of mimicking human uh, mental capacity have been the things that we can perform with barely a conscious thought. Things like language, common sense, vision and perception have proved to be the most challenging. But through 
improvements uh, in AI and through, I would argue, a uh, multimodal approach, we are seeing progress. But let me give you an example of perception, um, why it's challenging. This is an image, uh, a photograph that I took in my garden uh, a few years ago. I'm very proud of this photograph. And what you can see there uh, are three rabbits. Uh, a, a pet rabbit in the cage, a wild rabbit in the foreground that came to visit one day, and, uh, and a rabbit statue. So you, as a human, can, can look at that and identify those, uh, those items. For a machine learning system, it's hard, although convolutional neural networks have made great strides. Nevertheless, they have no concepts. So your convolutional neural network, if you succeeded in getting it to recognize the three rabbits, it would not have the concept of rabbitness. It would not know what a rabbit meant. It would not know the difference between a pet one and a wild one. It would not know uh, the, the, the concept of a, a rabbit statue. To provide that context, I would argue you always need the knowledge-based approaches. So in conclusion, I would argue that uh, the future of AI is based around bridging the spectrum of intelligence with multimodal AI techniques. I would say, don't rely on data alone. I know there's a big rush towards uh, machine learning based on large data sets, but I would argue that knowledge, encapsulated knowledge, provides context and understanding. I've mentioned DARBs. Uh, it is available as open source software, uh, and we're always looking for new real world applications. I can't finish without a plug for my book. In fact, I've been pouring my way through uh, uh, through page proofs today, uh, checking for, for errors. So um, Intelligent Systems for Engineers and Scientists, A Practical Guide to AI, the fourth edition is coming out uh, later this year. Um, I do run uh, a website at adrianhopgood.com, which includes a toolkit uh, uh, for supporting that. You'll find there a, a dated link to DARB. So, um, so I do need to uh, um, update, and I will be updating in the next few weeks, uh, the website with a new link to, uh, to an updated version of DARB. So if you're interested in it, probably best to email me and I'll keep you posted uh, on, on that. Um, lots of acknowledgements. All this work has been done really by other people with just me as the, uh, the supervisor. And I think that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, I found that extremely interesting. For me, it's one thing to know the theory behind something, but when you can see the uses and the real world applications, I think it really hits home and it shows you how useful this sort of technology can actually be. Um, there were so many different uses that you showed there and described. And uh, first, do we have any questions? Well, I can see there is an, there's already one in the chat box, actually, if I could just respond to that, um, yeah, sure. which actually picks up on the, the very last point I made, which is that, um, which is that the, the DARBs link um, online is, is rather old, uh, and uh, I will be refreshing that with a new version uh, in the coming uh, months. I think we also had one more question. Hello. Uh, I think there was a slide uh, regarding finding issues in electronic patient records and uh, issues found were something like patient ID, date of birth, date of death, and gender. All these entities are structured data. Is there any example of finding, most clinical notes are actually text. Any example of finding an amyloid in clinical notes? Yes, thank you. Yeah, we have been looking at both um, the structured uh, data, which is obviously the, the easier to deal with, but also the uh, the textual notes, trying to interpret those. And um, uh, so there's a certain amount of uh, text recognition there. And once you've recognized what's being said, uh, spotting the things that are uh, make sense or an inconsistent. But as you, you're, I mean, you're, you're rightly alluding to, that is by far the, uh, the most difficult end of the uh, the problem. 
Do we have any further questions? Apparently, there's a little bit more to the bottom question. It's not just the link, it's uh, Did you get that? Sorry, no, I didn't hear anything. Oh. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you, but I didn't hear the question. All right. uh, it's, it's also in the chat. It's, um, I, I don't have an impression of what, what DARBS is providing in those uh, use cases. So uh, is it like an extensible framework, or is it a tool which a user uses to find and investigate a problem? OK, thank you. Um, yes, it's a. Well, it, it is extensible uh, by, by its very nature, by the fact that it that it is um, uh, open source and it is programmed in, in C++. But uh, the idea is it provides a framework. So uh, whatever your um, it's, it's structured around these agents. So for every agent, it gives you a, uh, a structure. It's um, it gives you a sort of set of preconditions for when that agent uh, becomes active. Uh, it gives you some definitions of uh, uh of um of, of how you uh how how that agent communicates with the blackboard um and there's also a sort of a, a set sort of syntax for for rule-based agents uh which are really sort of powerful uh structure where you can embed uh a separate um separate modules uh either within the rule or as part of the the uh, structure of one of these agents so it's it's pretty flexible you can do most things in it um uh, but but it does sort of um constrain you to one particular mode of thinking as it were that this very much constrains you to this sort of a blackboard approach of all your agents communicating via that area of shared memory Okay, thank you. Uh, I think it's really impressive how many different unique and distinct problems that it could solve and also how you came up with solutions to uh, defeat the problems that you came across doing it. Um, so one of the examples you actually used was to do with uh, medicine and the medical side of things and I think that will tie in nicely with our next speech uh, which is from uh, it's on open source tools in machine learning applied to medical imaging.